Okay, good morning all. This is um, Chris from Backpack. Got an interesting session this morning talking about um, the basis around simplifying precision ag. Um, very pleased to be able to welcome a couple of uh, our integration partner speakers. Um, I'll just do a quick sound check and a couple of housekeeping things before we start. So, Mel, are you online there? I am, yes. Excellent. And I looks like Sam's there as well. Yeah, I'm here, Chris. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so we'll just step through this far, first part, and then um, once I'm done, I'll just stop sharing my screen so that you can pick up the share on your side. No worries. No worries, Matt. Thank you. Righto. So um, thank you, everybody, for uh, for jumping online. We're recording the session as well, so uh, we'll be able to put that back up if you want to be able to pass this on to uh, to uh, anybody else that might have an interest in sharing it. So I guess let's get stuck straight into it. There's um, a couple of pieces that we want to step through. And I guess the, the, the part of that is obviously around uh, soil health and the basis of crop nutrition is an integral part of what we want to talk about here. And I guess in a way, the work that we're doing as a group of um, businesses to join the dots on this stuff much better than has been done in the past, I guess offering alternate ways of being able to do things. So uh, if your uh, preference is to order directly on the laboratory, then you should have an easy way to be able to do that and, and, and join things back through. So I just popped in there. Uh, so often these ideas start off on the back of a beer coaster and this one certainly did as well. Um, and the basis there, and obviously that refers to pre-season uh, testing, whereas um, the reality is we're launching across 2020 within crop with some in-crop testing for deep ends and uh, plant tissue and so on. But um, you can see there we wanted a way of obviously determining how and where we might plan uh, where uh, soil testing or plant tissue testing occurs in a paddock. And of course, there's different methods to do that. Tim will speak through some of those on his session. The other bit was is obviously just creating choice as far as the process that you use to be able to do that. So that was that next level. If you're creating, uh, doing order creation or sample origination, as we call it now, there's really two bits to that. You want to be able to do that from a map to be able to determine exactly where in paddock uh, or across the farm you want to be able to take those tests using whatever method you, you prefer. And then, of course, the basis of uh, electronically sending that order to the lab. And for 2020, the basis uh, with our partnership with APAL is the ability to be able to do the electronic order to the lab. I guess over time, uh, other labs will come online with that. From there, of course, there's a, there's a process to follow in terms of interpretation, uh, depending on the crop type and so on, depending on the test type. So, uh, and to the extent that uh, you would you would need that interpretation. From there, obviously, following the the, 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 the method, um, turning that into some sort of recommendation that ultimately can be given to an operator in a paddock to load into a controller and, uh, and, and apply the job. So a lot of what you'll hear us talk about from our side um, is this notion of closing the loop. All we mean by that is at the beginning of the season, if we take Southern Annual Winter Crop as the, as the, um, as the model here, we do our pre-season planning, we want to set up the crop nutrition for the year. From there, we want to make it simple and fast to record everything that goes on the crop. So if it's every ag chem event, so that we can contribute the spray diary and very closely monitor residual chemical issues over time. And the same with nutrition. At a minimum, we want to get to the end of the season and be able to run uh, the post-season report that gives us our nutrient removal, uh, as well as the basis around nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency. So that's really sort of the, the, the basis of, um, or the context, if you like. So this notion around monitoring and benchmarking, it's probably off, it's, it's, it's out of our scope for today, but everything we're doing here at the front end of this pathway, this process is really designed to give us good information. So we really can monitor trend analysis, nutrient order and so on. So plenty to get through there. I'm gonna step through the first part of that down sort of that left-hand side. And then in about 10 minutes or so, I'll hand across to Sam, who will pick up the the, uh, the APOW farm to lab side. But you can see there, whichever way you choose to originate, uh, we bring the results back together so that we can step through the rest of the process. So of course, um, the back of napkin stuff needed to turn into something that actually steps, um, identifies the various steps. Um, but for the sake of the fact that we've only got um, a very short 
uh, period of time this morning. I'm not going to get into the detail of all of those, but just sort of overview them, I guess, so that you can see the, the process of it. So starting there, obviously, some sort of uh, paddock assessment, paddock level assessment, crop uh, enterprise uh, assessment as to where and how we might wish to um, uh, do our testing and, and, and select our sample sites. So let's just get stuck straight into that. Again, for the sake of um, time, I've chosen to just grab, um, step you through the process in some of those. I'm just going to jump into one section in terms of creating the sample order, uh, just so that you can see the basis of the, um, you know, how that actually works. So the idea of using some method uh, of assessment to determine where and how we might wish to place the samples. And again, Tim will speak to that. EM, there's, there's, there's certainly other methods. In this instance, and the way we're describing that today, we're talking about the basis of using 10 metre sentinel, sentinel NDVI imagery. You can see there in that image that um, I, uh, in, in Optera, I select a date range that I might wish to select from. It'll then tell me what results are available. And very importantly, they're given cloud cover masks so that we can determine that the image we would want to collect is actually appropriate to use. So the step from there is in that first instance. Um, from there, oh, just keep, from there, then the basis of um, selecting the test sites uh, and, and determining where and how we want those to be. And then we need to create a purchase order. So again, I'll just jump across, um, just, just really briefly across into the actual um, platform. So I'm actually uh, in our, what we call our staging area or a development area. So what you'll see here will look like the production side that you can see at the moment, but it's a different, uh, a different login. So you won't, until we roll this out on the 28th of May, uh, see exactly what I'm showing you here this morning. But the basis is, is that I can go in and just simply create uh, any type of pin. The one I'm going to display to you today is just the basis of creating a sample order. So if I select a particular site that I would have created before um, and say I'll create a purchase order from that, you can just see it's a really just um, a straightforward process. Um, scan the barcode, uh, determine the depth that I might want this first test to be. Uh, select the lab that I want to uh, order against. Um, I'll just grab a deep end test. And then from there, and a really important bit is determining what, um, what interpretation model for um, this particular test. And that becomes important in the context of the way we automate the process after this. So I'll just come back out of there, that again on that side. That's as um, straightforward as that at that point. Um, you can see in this order, I'm intentionally just um, skipping part of the process is the fact that I've, at that point I've created the sample order. Um, I now obviously need to take that out into the paddock uh, with the mobile device that goes offline where it shows me the pins and the, and the, uh, the basis I can use, obviously use the locate me capability of the offline apps to be able to then navigate to that point. So that's pretty um, straightforward from that side. So just again, um, stepping through the process from there, once we've got the results back, um, then this is where we were talking before. If we nominated the evaluation table at the beginning, then we can be we can automate the process of giving a detailed status. And it's a similar process on, on, on SAM's side as well. And I think that's a really important part of this because it will, will overall will make the, the basis of processing much faster. So the, con the context there is, um, we've got uh, status that comes with the email straight on to say our, our iPad. I can then jump in from there and, and create a crop nutrition rec on the fly. Um, and, and, and at that point, I could send that off to the grower or um, uh, with the basis of the status report linked with it. So without necessarily for the traditional soulmate users necessarily need to go back into soulmate at that point, um, the context is there to be able to speed this process up. It may be that you choose, you, you do go back in and, and, and create a recommendation later point for, if you like, um, audit trail sake or whatever, but there's not a need to do that. Um, from there, the next part is um, we wanted obviously the, the basis around PA to really simplify that process. So that's just stepping across to the data farming side, which obviously Tim will step through in a bit more detail. But in terms of simplification, we wanted the ability to uh, select that image at that point and quickly and easily determine either a three or a five zone map from that. And once we've, we've seen our results and we have our detailed status by 
crop type variety district target yield, then it's a, a relatively straightforward process to determine the, the, the rates for the various zones. And we'd apply those, you can see there in the screen, to low, medium and high in that instance in a three, file, in a, in a, in a three zone, such that uh, it gives us the shape file to be able to send straight to the controller and obviously send off with the grower, and, uh, sorry, the, with the nutrient rec. Um, so the last part of that, of course, is um, sending that off. Uh, the shape file obviously has the, uh, the file to go to the controller. We have the nutrient status there. Um, so it's a relatively complete recommendation in that sense. Um, again, the results have been uploaded um, uh, via the, the, uh, from the lab. So you could go back into either Optera, FertRec or SawMate if you cho chose to, if you, if you needed to at a later point for reference. So that's the, 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 the process uh, in that sense. Um, from there, um, we want to obviously capture the application event. So at the point where, where the nutrient rec has been created, then that job as such is available in Paddock Book. And Paddock Book is the uh, application that we built for the operators to use, the operators and all the contractors. Now, grab some screenshots there, obviously, where the detail would relate to an Ag Chem recommendation. But within Paddock Book, uh, it contains or it has the ability to be able to do as applied for a bunch of different types of job types. So crop, crop establishment, Ag Chem, a crop nutrition rec that we're talking about here. The basis of just operations rec, it might be you sending a job to an operator to go and windrow the canola paddocks or, and, 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 and certainly livestock as well. So the basis of doing livestock treatments for animal health or supplements or mob movements. So again, just sort of joining the dots in the, in, in the context. By doing that, and certainly for the context of applying the application rec, then what we're, we're doing, of course, is at the end of the season, we've collected all that detail so that we can go in and run nutrient removal. Uh, we can go in and, and uh, determine what our nutrient uh, use efficiency rates and so on were just by this, this basis of recording two actuals across the season. Really important. All right, just uh, following on from there, where else and how, how else may I wish to use that information? Uh, so there's um, a number of new things that we've been working on for quite a while that all come together now uh, to be to go live at the end of May to be ready for this crop management phase. So just the basis of having much easier access to the results than the traditional soilmate users would have had. So you can see that top right hand corner, just the basis of if you wish to, to turn on a particular layer. Um, to be able to see all the uh, the soil test results for a particular soil test for a, for, for a uh, you know in a, in a location in a paddock, just on the bottom right hand side is the basis of for NPKs uh, soil pH organic carbon the ability to be able to turn these layers on and off. Um, so you can see there you select on the right hand side what you would wish to see, and the way we've designed that is um, you then have uh, the basis of the, the, the pie if you like and you can select up to six different values. So you can see that I'm, I'm taking that from our uh, development area, staging area. So just there in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the color coding and the labels, which they're, they're just working on to be ready to go for next week. But the basis is, is that you can carry that with you on your iPad, on your iPhone, uh, on the desktop to, to computer to be able to see those historical results. So where we're taking that from there is, and the next level again, is a substantial reference data um, project and uh, Chris Dowling uh, sends his apologies today. We're actually doing a project with CSIRO, bringing a lot of those reference data import layers through and he's otherwise detained on that. You can see there on the left-hand side, just a whole bunch of elements that we have reference data for pretty much right across the country in the context of um, 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 soil layers, soil types. Um, the proof of concept for that has been going on in Queensland for several months around the REFAC legislation and there's plenty to bring in there in terms of soil physical characteristics and other things that you may wish to measure and monitor. So there's just an example of the, uh, the Queensland based stuff that's come out of the uh, Department of the DPI in Queensland, but of course that reference data exists across Australia. Um, it's a substantial exercise. We'll continue to work on that out over the next three to six months. I'd expect most areas to come online by, uh, by uh, late spring, early summer this year to be ready for 2021 news. But um, really, I guess, interesting for us in terms of really expanding out the capability of what we're doing here.
All righty, um, I just need to wrap up fairly shortly to hand across to Sam. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you are a traditional SawMate user, uh, those two programs uh, started life separately, so hence separate databases. So there's a process that you should only need to do once uh, that gives you the ability just to, with all of your SawMate paddocks, for example, to make sure that the, the naming grower farm paddock zone matches up on both sides of the coin so that this stuff will automatically flow through to the Optera mapping side. Um, as well as from Sam's um, side, from APOW's side, uh, if you're originating on, over there, we're actually using the geolocation of the soil test to determine, to match it to a uh, grow farm paddock, i.e. the polygon that, uh, that is the paddock boundary to automate that process. So it's a necessary bit for us to get lined up. If you were a soilmate user only, then it's a it's a very fast process to take all that paddock and, and replicate it across to the Optera side. So we'll step through that with you individually, uh, just just to uh, make sure that that's up and running properly for all this stuff to to flow through. Okay, um, just to finish off on there, some other quick changes that are coming through. There's been plenty of um, requests or um, change requests, as we call them, for the basis of being able to change high to high res base map layers. Um, so that's a, a feature that's coming online, whether that's ECW or GeoTIFF or other, other bases, and Tim will speak a little more to that as well. Um, so weather recording stuff uh, that uh, just is getting ready for crop management phase. So the ability to manage the weather stations, whether they're bomb sites or regional DPI sites, or in fact on farm weather stations. So throughout Victoria, New South Wales, for example, all the Oz forecast sites, uh, are automatically there and the ability to select weather stations and see the weather details coming through. Of course, that's important at the end of the season to be able to automatically calculate water use efficiency. Alrighty, so I'm just a minute and a bit over time, but uh, at that point, um, I'll hand across to Sam and he'll pick up the other side of uh, that whole discussion and step you through that. So Sam, I'll just stop sharing. And then you'll be able to share your screen from there. Uh, yeah, I think you might need to allow me to share my screen, Chris. I'll actually say make host, make you the host for now, Sam, so that you can you can control the sharing. Brilliant. Uh... Yep, got it. Let me just uh, lost the zoom. Well, right, thanks, um, Chris, for the opportunity. Um, I can't actually see myself at the moment. That's all right. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to give a, I suppose, a quick um, intro into into APAL and a bit of background for those that don't uh, aren't aware of us, uh, more more in the probably central northern New South Wales area. Um, what we're focusing on and and I suppose where this integration's um, come about and then where we're looking to partner with and what we're trying to achieve. So um, so APAL has been as in the brand's been in Australia for just over twenty years. Um, got uh, bought out six years ago by Ryan uh, Anna Walker and, and rebranded to Australian Precision Ag Lab and, and has grown um, from there with a, with a real focus on uh, quality um, in terms of lab testing and, and the integrity that comes with that through accreditations. Um, the business has grown significantly, which I'll, I'll go through from, from then till now um, shortly. Um, and, and as a result, uh, the focus has moved into a lot of R&D and, and method development, um, which combines with validation in the field. So um, another company was set up in 2016 called Agronomy Solutions. Um, Sean Mason runs that. Um, he, he's the, uh, the man that brought DGT Phosphorus to, to the market and, and continues to do so. So we're actively involved in the R&D space. Um, to, to further develop uh, new testing, new methods um, in the field. Um, we also have a, a facility in Western Australia, which started in 2017. Um, part of the process is that's a receivable site, which does some sample preparation. Um, certainly the focus in the next 12 months is to 
um, replicate this in some way in the eastern states to have um, a physical presence, um, which we're working through at the moment. Um, and part of that had been getting boots on the ground um, and getting involved with, with consultants um, throughout the area. Um, and then I suppose some big changes in the last uh, 18 months is that we moved into uh, brand new facilities, which was sort of bare bone custom built. So, um, you know, we pushed through 100,000 samples, um, you know, nearly two years ago. We're, we're now um, up around 140 to 150,000 samples, which from, from the humble beginnings of 2014, we were, we were doing about 10,000 samples a year. Um, so with this has come, um, you know, increased capacity. Um, certainly we're, we're hitting our turnaround times um, and the labs never run more smoothly. Um, so we're in a really good position there. Um, and then myself, I, I joined the business uh, last July um, and have just recently moved to Adelaide um, in the last week. Um, you know, why, why are both of us in, the, in this business and in, in the industry, I suppose, is to... You know, innovation and soil testing had, had been uh, lacking over a, a long period of time. Um, so we're certainly um, investing in that space, um, collaborating with people on the ground to support data, um, looking at what's what's next, I suppose. We know that, you know, most areas, uh, moisture is a limiting factor, but, uh, you know, with the renewed focus on below the crop, I suppose, soil data um, to, to drive yield increases and then, you know, tools to manage that, which is, I suppose, really integrating with partners and developing our own software um, over the last five years. Um, uh, you know, our focus um, and a big key point of what Chris went through about our, you know, integration is that we, we've become electronic fully. So we're, you know, trying to be paperless. Um, you know, customer engagement is, is around the clock where um, it doesn't matter what time of the night you get in from, from uh, out in the paddock sampling, you can do an on, a submission online, um, put it in the mail, um, and all the information flows through. We've worked um, uh, really hard on getting our farm to lab platform um, to a point where it is at the moment, and there are some duplications in the data that's displayed, obviously, with what uh, has created. But uh, where we differ is that farm to lab and, and APAL are coming from the the front end of the process, so that is um, creating a sample plan, uh, where am I sampling from, why am I sampling from, um, and enabling that to get to the, to the lab really efficiently. And then no different to um, Optera and, and other platforms is about visualising that data uh, in a more meaningful way than just traditionally by um, printed PDF or an Excel spreadsheet. So. Um, uh, there is, you know, I'll take off offline or in, um, individually with, with uh, people that want to look at through that. But um, what we're about with the integration is really about getting the information into the hands of those that need it. Uh, not trying to put too many roadblocks up and, and try to be everything to everybody. Um, we've created a, a soil sampling platform and, and that's the extent of it. And that's why we're working with the likes of, um, you know, Terra and data farming around putting the data in the hands of who needs it and then making the, you know, the growers that benefit from it able to see it as well. So, um, you know, the big focus there, um, uh, you know, focus is around turnaround time, quality and integrity of the results um, and then bringing through that innovative new technology. Um, I mentioned DGT, phosphorus, um, certainly the mid infrared. Um, which is doing soil texture, Australian classification, sand silk clay percentage at the moment, plus looking at some other um, methods that can be um, utilised by, by the scanning, um, some infield work with near infrared, and then just um, consistently um, investing in process improvement within the lab um, to ensure turnaround time um, of results, but also you know that quality and integrity piece. So. <clears throat> Something to, I suppose, highlight that is coming through, and that's the mid infrared. So we've, uh, this has been built from scratch, the robot, um, to enable the, the scanning to be um, as automated as, as possible. Um, and what's been coming through that space is um, particle size analysis, as I mentioned, and soil textual class, um, also carbonate percentage. Um, you know, we're looking at PBI and organic carbon at the moment and, and getting pretty close to some good correlations there. And, and with, with plenty of uh, samples coming through our data set now. 
Um, and then uh, there's a few others to look at later, plan available water and, and CEC and you know, some of the, the graphing done from satellite imagery and, and knowledge of uh, soil moisture, certainly I don't think the plan available water is probably as far away as, as we might think. Um, for those that are uh, agronomically, technically related, that's some of the, that's where the clay, sand, silt percentages are at. So pretty good correlations and allowed us to, to really, I suppose, drive this commercially uh, out to the market. Um, I'll just, just quickly go through our, um, sorry, um, lab numbers. So just identifying where we're grown um, and where we're grown from and that we're fully compliant with, with all the ASPAC uh, testing that can be done. Um, so that's a bit of a, a really quick one on, on where we're at. Um, I'll just quickly get up. Um, can you see the, can you see the platform? Yep, all good, Sam. So just, just quickly, the platform, I suppose what we've enabled is, is uh, historical soil sites to be, to be brought in. It doesn't matter whether they've got, um, obviously, GPS coordinates help, but we can also bring them in um, on a paddock basis as long as the paddock name lines up with the, with the shape file. Um, and this is about a couple of different ways of um, identifying um, why am I sampling. So you could, this is looking at pH. Um, we can right click on the, on the pH and change um, between analytes, the same with the phosphorus as we can um, go through them all to soil texture where you've got them. Um, and this is simply about dragging them to add to a plan or right clicking with the mouse and holding down and then we, we've added them to the plan. So one way of generating the plan. Um, the other way is doing it historically. We know a lot of people sample uh, regularly, whether they're on a two, three, four year rotation, et cetera. You can change that over here um, and the darker they are. Obviously the, uh, the, the further away they were sampled so to, to um, get them done. And then, and then really, um, so finalising the plan um, to send through. And this is taking out some of that, same as what Altera is doing is it's creating less work in the paddock. So you can um, add depths, et cetera in here. Um, and then what, what the benefit of the integration is when we send it to the device to be sampled in the paddock, we can upload it into um, straight into SoilMate for the interpretation. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we, we're focused on the front end of the sampling, um, and now we're, we've got a partner in this space allowing the user from uh, pre paddock to paddock right through to interpretation and then to showing the grower uh, the information. It's, it's fully electronic. Um, and and uh, we're focusing on that. So um, I'll probably leave that there and, and um, again, can take any of this offline and, and do more, uh, you know, I find it better to step through with, with individuals and businesses one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but, you know, we're certainly committed to this in, in this space where uh, we're probably own independent uh, lab. Um, myself and Ryan are, are very accessible for anything and, and we're going to continue to, um, invest in, in this integration space with, with the likes of, um, you know, data farming and, and back paddock to, to get the most out of the, the information. So um, with that, Chris, if there's no... Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. So again, we I need to claim back, I think, the... Yeah, mate, I'm just trying to get it up. Oh, just give me one second, mate. Well, here we go. Stop share. There we go. Okay. So Tim should be online. I think from what I can see, he's probably just yep. muted out. Yeah, yeah. But just again, uh, host as participant um, has uh, disabled it, mate. So just need that. Cut me across. Yep. So it's obviously a setting that I need to change. So I just need to make sure I make you the host. Reclaim host and come back over here and make Tim the host. Yes. Okay. You have the ship. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah. Um, appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, have a chat to you about um, the integration we're doing with the back paddock. Um, you know, um, we've been talking, you know, and working together for for many years. So it's really good to see this come to fruition. Um, data farming is only less than three years old for those that aren't aware. Um, 
but we've been in this space for over 20 years in the precision ag space. And I, <clears throat> I guess data farming is all about getting digital, digital data to the, to the masses. And I think there's been too much hype, not enough reality in the whole precision ag space. And so data farming is just 100% focused on getting the, the everyday person using digital tools uh, in their daily business. And that, that's, I think, really important. That seems that seemingly everyone else seems to have missed. They want to create more bells and whistles and not really focus on um, just delivering value and in a basic form to back to people. So um, that's my contact details. Um, I want to spend one one second really on what the hell all this stuff means because we, we you, I, I guess as advisors you get thrown all of these fandangled terms every second day. Um, the, the imagery that we're using, I want to explain about how it works a little bit. Um, we can see with our eyes, uh, red, green and blue, right? That's why someone's shirt is blue is because it's reflecting all the blue light that's coming out and it's absorbing all the other colors. So we can see things only in this, right in the far left hand side of this screen. I assume you can see that. Okay. Um, where, you know, um, often we'll see changes in the, in the plant, you know, in its, in its coloring. If, if a plant starts to die off, well, it turns yellow and brown. So we get to see those things. But when a plant is really actively growing, we don't see a lot of the things that are, it's responding to, especially in the, uh, with, with regards to chlorophyll. So what a satellite does is picking up bands of light that are well beyond what we can see. And that's what sets a photograph apart from what we can do with satellite imagery. Um, the blue line that you can see on here, I hope you can see that okay, Chris, can everyone yeah, see that? Yeah, no, spot on, yep. Yep, that there is a, that represents a healthy plant. Now you'll see there's a blip in the blue and the green. And when you get a really, really healthy plant, it turns that bluey green, like a, a wheat plant that's flagging, you know, it looks beautiful. So that's what we see. But what the satellite sees is this massive blip in the near infrared spectrum. Um, because chlorophyll reflects near infrared light, um, it's very much, very responsive to small changes in, 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 uh, in that light spectrum that we can't see. We're not seeing that. Um, so we do a simple index called NDVI, which most of you probably heard of, but it's a normalized difference vegetation index. It's the most commonly and widely used index and we, there's a million of them, right? But we're starting with something to get people into this, uh, into this game and to actually start to bring in the infrareds part of the spectrum to give you these things that your eyes can't see. The red edge that everyone's all getting all excited about at the moment is really the difference between the red and the near infrared. And I, I don't, I'm not gonna go into that today, but I thought I'd just give you a quick, uh, it's, I guess it's um, university science, but um, it just explains why we're using NDVI, um, why we're using satellites and not what your eyes can see. And it creates an index. Like I said before, an NDVI stands for an index. It's the difference between the infrared light and the red light. And if a plant starts to die off, this this the numbers in the near infrared start to drop, and the and the numbers in the red start to go up. So the difference becomes less, and the NDVI values that we see on the imagery reduces. So the bigger the number, the better the crop. The smaller the number, the smaller the crop. Or the more mature it is, for example. Like as the crop dies, it the number also reduces. If that makes sense. So. Let's jump to what a satellite image looks like in, in the, and I've done the NDVI here. So this is looking across, you know, uh, 50,000 acres or whatever it might be. You know, huge sway of the land. You can see in the brown is a fallow paddock, in the blue is a very actively grown crop. That's really cool if you want to look across how does, does the, um, you know, what does it look like in the district? And this is our platform that we've developed um, um, about two, two and a half years ago. And it, it just provides you with every five days satellite imagery that's coming in from Sentinel, which is a 10 meter pixel data, really good for Broadacre as a starting point. It brings it in every five days anywhere in the world. And we're providing this out to the customers uh, as a free service to give people a taste of what the hell this stuff actually means. So that's really cool at that sort of level. But if I zoom into this red field in the middle, and you might not be able to see it, but if I zoom into that field and I don't change the color stretch at all, 
So the lows remain low and the highs are blue across that whole scene. That doesn't really give me much information, to be honest. That tells me that it all looks pretty good. It's not until we clip that, uh, clip that field or the image to that field that we get an image that looks like this. And that's the same image you can see down the bottom. That's the 19th of July. That's the same image on the same day. But what we're doing is clipping that to the field boundary now and stretching those colors now, not over the whole scene, but just between the lowest and the highest point in that field. And if you look down the bottom right hand corner, it's quite small, sorry. But you can see the minimum number there is 0 0.6, 2, and the maximum number is 0 0.77. So we've deliberately, deliberately stretched the colors to bring out the differences in that paddock. Because if I'm, if I'm going to the paddock to check that, I want to know where's the best, the worst, and where's the bit in the middle. If I used an image before, it's pretty well useless. And I see a lot of other companies putting out imagery that don't take this into account. So what you're going to see, what you're seeing in Optera now is this exact clipped image delivered into Optera, not through our platform, but through the back end, if you like, um, through an API. So we realized early on that we want to integrate with as many people as possible and APEL and, and Backpatic are two of our key partners. Um, and I think you want to, you don't want to use more software, you want to use less. So we want to do more in your current software. And that's why we're feeding this data in to your current software. Um, like Chris said, you can get your cloud cover percentages. So Optera automatically masks out the stuff that's too high a percent. But um, we, we, we give you every five days regardless here and you make up your own one, whether it's cloudy or not. Um, so that now that's, that's the valuable bit. Those colors now come, come through to Optera. Um, the thing we're working on right now is, as Chris mentioned, is to get the automated zoning. So we've created a tool that turns that image into a three zone or five, um, we'll do a five zone as well for Optera. So a three or five zone map. So it's taking that all those pixels and just turning into three simple polygons, high, medium, and low. Um, and we, you can tell we've smoothed out those areas because a controller in a machine does not want to be going up and down, up and down, up and down. It'll just, it'll do its head in. So we've smoothed this out deliberately. We put some algorithms in there um, to actually uh, classify all the block areas together. And <clears throat> you put your, as you, as you saw in Optera, you can put your rates in here. And uh, in our case, we're charging um, for this service, but this will be through Optera where you'll be able to do um, um, zone maps in there in, 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 the, in the coming little while. We're working on that at the moment, but trying to get that now into an actionable solution, right? There's pretty data. You go out the paddock, you ground through it with your soil sampling, as Chris mentioned, and now you're putting it back into an RX, an application map for the, for the machine. And that turns that into a, a shape file, which is consumable in most new machines. And it will vary the rate automatically um, as you go through the field depending on what product you're applying and, and, and how you're doing it. So that's what we're working on next. Um, I guess the traction we've got out of doing that is, is been unbelievable. I, I, I'm sort of hard to believe that we've now got 16,500 farms in our data farming platform using this. We see the integration with Optera very important to um, help, uh, you know, the vast majority of advisors in Australia using uh, uh, um, uh, uh, like a, a digital platform now to, to do their recs, um, to bring all this information into your back pocket, I guess. So, you know, the, the market's ready for this stuff. It, it's been ready for a long time. It's just putting it into a format that's really easy to use has been our success. And I guess that's what we're trying to do here as well with the integration piece, make it so bloody simple. It's just, you do it every day, you know, and that's what we've got to get to. Um, the other thing we've been working on and it, may not suit the audience today, but just wanted to allude you to another thing that we've 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 processed about a thousand fields of um, high resolution data over this last summer. We've got some winter products coming out too. Like we mentioned before, Sentinel is uh, 10 meter resolution. Um, that's what that looks like on a vineyard. Um, but we're now doing 0.5 meter resolution data from a satellite as well um, for a price. And in time, this will also be come across through API. But, you know, you can see from a vineyard or from a tree crop or from an intensive uh, cropping enterprise, you know, that compared to that is, is just chalk and cheese. So there's, there's just a plethora of satellites coming on the market and we're gonna see lots of data available, all in that sub meter resolution 
sort of realm and the prices are going to get very competitive. So you'll see a lot more data coming and we'll hopefully funnel all that through Optera as we progress uh, through this journey together. Um, we talked briefly about cloud. It's very important that you check your images for cloud. Uh, you can see in this image here, we've masked out the cloud in red. We missed this bit of cloud in white. It's an automatic detection thing. So we missed those little blobs and we missed the cloud shadow. And you can see on the right hand side in the NDVI image, you know, completely different results, right? So you cannot trust that image at all if you've got any cloud or cloud shadow. So it's very important to check for those things. Otherwise, you're going to get a bum steer. If you just look at that NDVI on the right, you think, holy shit, there's something wrong in this part of the paddock. So, um, and there was a classic on Twitter the other day that one of the farmers put up and thought there was a big problem and he realized it was a blob of cloud in the middle of the paddock. So uh, you can have a look on our Twitter feed. Um, the other thing we want to integrate uh, for the next season soil sampling is what we call stack. So that's putting five years of NDVI together and giving you five zones over five years. So this just allows you to pick the dates that you want over the last five years. It ignores any fallow paddocks during those times and it stacks it all together for you to give you an idea. This is perfectly fit, it fits perfectly into soil sampling because these long-term impacts are generally, generally soil types, right? Um, because waterlogging, for example, will come and go. Um, but things that stay there for the longer term uh, are going to show up in these types of images. And this is this is where we're working with APEL and, and Optera back paddock to, to really integrate this piece as well so that you can help determine where to take your samples based on some long-term data. If you don't have any yield data, for example, if you've got no yield data or it's crappy yield data, this, this will give you a really good indication of where to sample. So, so watch this space this is coming soon um, uh, for the next season. Um, and I just wanted to finish on a thing about NDVI imagery. Uh, we get a lot of the boffins, uh, particularly university boffins saying that, oh, it's not quite correlated to yield. You can't make any claims. And it's like, yeah, it's, it might not be 100% correlated to yield, but it's pretty bloody good. It's a very, very good indicator of yield potential um, as the season progresses. A big plant is gonna grow generally a bigger yield unless it runs out of water. A small plant is never gonna grow a big yield unless something magical happens. Right, so this is an example of a image on the left and a, and a harvest yield monitor on the right. You can see all the problems in the yield monitor data. There's been an error down here and there's gaps and they, they loosely match up, right? It's not, it's not perfect, but it's a bloody good start. And I think use this tool for what it is. Don't read into it too much. Um, use it as, you, as your daily scouting activities to help you identify areas of the field you should be sampling and particularly tissue sampling. I mean, if you're, tissue, if you're doing tissue samples without any indication of where to take them based on imagery, I think that those days have got to go. We've got to target our tissue sampling based on infield imagery, just like we've got to target our soil testing based on, on yield. So um, yeah, that's it from me, Chris. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Tim. So what I think we should do then with both Sam and Tim still online, maybe just open the floor for a minute. I'll just grab back control if I can, please, Tim, just a second. Um, so we've got a chat, the, the, um, the chat session line is open there if anybody wants to just fire a question off through there or just reclaim host. Uh, or uh, I've got everybody muted out, but if you want to actually ask a question, just um, you can just go into the controls here and unmute for a time. We are, as I said before, we are recording the session, so we'll pop that back up on uh, YouTube over the next couple of days. Uh, if you yeah, want to type, to... A, type a chat too. There's a chat there if you just want to type a question. Yeah, just um... so I'll just leave that for a minute. Um, Tim, like a couple of quick questions I had. Um, you're talking about NBBI um, predominantly. When you're doing assessment for, uh, say, for plant tissue or for in crop testing for deep end, say, what other methods might you use over time? Um, what other uh, in terms of imagery and so on, and, and, and where do you sit with that? You mean different indexes, Chris? Yeah, well, so things, I know you're doing a lot of work with EM, for example. Where does that fit into that equation? Yeah, EM, electromagnetics, is really about the base soil layer um, and identifying clay contents and, um, you know, and, and where those different soils are. So that's really much about a soil testing um, thing. I think you need to also look at the topography and the layout and where waterlogging might be. Uh, particularly 
uh, you know, with, with regard to nitrogen and those kind of things. But, you know, in, in field tissue sampling, there is other algorithms that we can use from a satellite, but um, NDVI is a really good starting point just to give you the greenness of that crop, the biomass, um, start, start base your sampling off that. There's, there's a whole heap of other indexes like chlorophyll indexes and things, but we don't want to get too fancy too quick. Um, so yeah, that's, um, EMs are a really good tool to start. Um, uh, as a question comes through there on, on, on the chat. Uh, can we alter the zones when they're created? Um, not at the moment. Um, we're working that on a next, next uh, big update is to, to, cause sometimes the low zone might not be the same in one part of the paddock is another part of the paddock. It might be from a different, different cause. So therefore you might want to, you know, the low zone in the northeast corner is different to the low zone in the southwest corner. Let's keep them separate. So at the moment we can't, but um, that'll be functionality we'll be building in time. And, and the other thing we're, we're uh, talking about is the granularity. So if you're spreading with, a, with an aeroplane, um, you're going to want a different sort of shape file or a, a, an application map than if you're going with a single nozzle control on a boom spray, right? It's going to be completely different granularity. So we'll have the ability to smooth that out or, or coarsen it up depending on your application requirements. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Well, that uh, with no other questions in the group chat, um, I would say we'll probably do a wrap up from there. Thanks very much, Sam. Thanks very much, Tim, for coming online and and, uh, and participating. No worries. Thanks, Chris, for the opportunity. Cheers.